Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations called to order. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here today, and thank you to my uh, partner in this effort, Ranking Member Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Uh, at our um, last hearing, we began uh, this inquiry into uh, Saudi Arabian public investment funds unprecedented deal with the PGA Tour. Many Americans were outraged when we learned, quite astonishingly, that an authoritarian foreign government with a horrific human rights record entered into an agreement that would allow it effectively to take over an entire American sport. Our subcommittee swiftly initiated this inquiry to learn more about not only how this takeover was allowed to happen, but why, what it means for the future, and not only for golf, but other cherished American institutions, and what that means for our own freedoms. Sports have tremendous power, power to do good. Professional athletes often serve as ambassadors for our ideals and role models for our children. But as I said in our first hearing in July, this inquiry is about much more than the game of golf. It's about more than sports. It's about the need for transparency so Americans can understand when valuable foreign investment becomes a vehicle for malign foreign influence. As our inquiry has progressed, we have found that there are many, many reasons to be concerned. While we received important information from the PGA Tour, which sent two representatives to testify at our first hearing, the institution that is attempting to take over American Golf, the Saudi Public Investment Fund, or PIF, has refused to cooperate. In fact, they've refused to make any witness available to testify or to produce a single document. We can only infer that this means the, that Saudi Arabia intends to gain the benefit of our freedoms while avoiding the obligations of our laws. The PIF is run under the, quote, chairmanship and guidance, end quote, of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the effective Saudi leader, Saudi Arabia's use of foreign, of sovereign wealth fund resources to attempt to gain influence in the United States should trouble us all. Under Crown Prince bin Salman, Saudi Arabia remains a brutal regime, utterly resistant to criticism, devoid of any right of free speech, and ruthless in its response to anyone who questions it. Saudi Arabia is a country where just two months ago, Mohammed al-Ghamdi, a retired teacher, was sentenced to death for criticizing the government on YouTube and other social media accounts, including on Twitter accounts that had a total of just 10 followers. Saudi Arabia is a country where in the past year, border guards have killed hundreds of Ethiopian migrants and asylum seekers, many of whom were children, as they tried to cross the border with Yemen. And the PIF has been implicated in some of Saudi Arabia's most abhorrent atrocities. The PIF itself is the leading development of NEOM, a futuristic city planned for the desert and centerpiece of Crown Bin Salman's Vision 2030. When members of the Huwait tribe who live near the planned city resisted forced eviction from their homes, three tribe members who were, were captured and sentenced to death by the Saudi government, while three others were sentenced to decades of imprisonment. Another man from the same tribe was reportedly killed in his own home by Saudi special forces. The PIF also played a central role in the brazen kidnapping 
and murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Having taken ownership of the planes that were later used to transport Khashoggi's assassins to Turkey, where they carried out that horrific act. The PIF's planes were used to transport the killers of Jamal Khashoggi by private flights. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Saudi Arabia's role in the September 11 attacks on our country. This week marks 22 years since those horrific attacks. Not only did 15 of the 19 hijackers come from Saudi Arabia, but in the years since, evidence have come to light, compelling and mounting evidence, revealing that the Saudi government may have known or knowingly aided some of these hijackers. The Saudi government must take responsibility for its role, and our own government must be transparent about what actually happened. And that is why earlier this week, along with ranking member Johnson, I wrote to the Attorney General and the FBI Director demanding full transparency over everything they know. The families of 9-11 vi victims need and deserve accountability, and they are entitled to answers. All of America is entitled to answers about Saudi role in the 9-11 attacks. I'm encouraged that the Department of Justice and the FBI have responded. They provided us with an initial set of documents, which are unfortunately still highly redacted. But they've said that they are committed to working with us going forward. They have a lot more work to do to provide full transparency, and the proof will be in how they do that work. Without objection, I'd like to enter into the record the FBI's initial production in response to our, in response to our subpoena, which removes certain redactions from documents regarding Saudi Arabia's role in the 9-11 tax. Without objection, so ordered. As many experts have noted, Saudi Arabia's investments in golf, as well as its other investments in global sports, represent an attempt to sports wash the horrific record that it has on human rights and influence how the kingdom is perceived around the world. At a time when authoritarian regimes are gaining power and people around the world are losing freedom, it is important that we stay vigilant against anyone who wants to protect, promote, or normalize autocracy. Saudi Arabia's bid to buy professional golf in America is not just one investment in a vacuum. It is instead part of a web of growing investments in this country. They are largely unknown, and they are almost entirely without oversight. Since our July hearing, this subcommittee has looked closely at the Saudi government's investments in the United States. And we have been troubled not only by what we have seen, but what we have not seen. The PIF's United States investments go far beyond golf and have grown exponentially in the past five years. The little information that's publicly available shows that PIF's U.S. investments were a little over $2 billion in 2018. Today, just five years later, they stand at more than $35 billion. The PIF had made, has made investments in electronic vehicles, gaming, entertainment, and more with significant potential implications of control over those companies. In fact, last year it formed a wholly owned United States subsidiary based in New York. That information is based just on what can be discerned from very meager public sources. We have no way of knowing whether PIF has other investments in private equity, privately held companies, or other areas where public disclosure is not required. The 35 billion that we know of may be just the tip of the iceberg. As we will hear today, 
Commercial investment has been used by foreign governments like China and Russia as part of a larger influence and disinformation campaign. What we know so far about Saudi Arabia's investments show the hallmarks of a similar effort. While we have laws that require the review of foreign investments that pose direct threats to our national security, and we require agents of foreign governments to file disclosures, our current laws largely leave commercial investment by foreign governments in the shadows, invisible. These gaps may leave room for sophisticated regimes to engage in influence campaigns without any scrutiny or public knowledge. I want to be clear. The United States has a long and proud history of welcoming foreign investment. Open investment is central to our economy and has helped to spur innovation. Time and again, we must continue to open our arms and our markets. But we also ought to demand transparency so that we can understand the strings that are attached to certain investments, especially those that come directly from authoritarian regimes. With this inquiry, we hope to explore the extent to which Saudi Arabia is exploiting these loopholes and how other countries like China may do so as well. We also hope to learn ways in which we can start to close those gaps. The PIF has offered none of the transparency necessary to understand its goals or the extent of its influence efforts. This subcommittee has repeatedly sought cooperation from the PIF with our inquiry and they have persistently refused. The PIF's refusal to cooperate is an affront to our authority and to our institutions. Congress has a constitutional responsibility to regulate American commerce and an inquiry into PIF's investment in the United States is well within this subcommittee's mandate. And that is why today I issued a subpoena to the PIF through its U.S. subsidiary for records concerning the PIF's investments in the United States. I also provided a memorandum to members of the subcommittee providing further detail on the need for this subpoena. Without objection, I'd like to enter that subpoena and memorandum into the record. Uh, as I wrote to the governor of the PIF last month, it cannot have it both ways. If it wants to engage with the United States commercially, it must be subject to United States law and oversight. That oversight includes this subcommittee's inquiry. The PIF and the Saudi government cannot take advantage of our democratic freedoms and cloak themselves in dictatorial secrecy. They can use democratic institutions but they cannot leverage them to promote suppression and oppression. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses, each of whom brings expertise and experience with different concerns surrounding the PIF's investment. I hope to be able to shed light, not only on why this inquiry must continue, and it will continue, but also how we can address risks that may exist from other countries, similar to Saudi Arabia, as we move forward. With that, I turn to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Monday, this Monday, at 7.46 a.m. Central Time, I was in the Milwaukee airport awaiting my flight to D.C. when the entire terminal stopped and stood silent for 60 seconds to somberly commemorate the 22nd anniversary of the horrors of 9-11. Over the weekend, I also saw a report about students born after 9-11 acknowledging the tragedy that had changed our world forever. I was grateful those students had at least been taught that piece of history and that it had made a powerful impression on them. For those of us who were alive on that day, we will never forget where we were, who, were, who we were with, and what we were doing when we first heard of that brutal attack. For those of us who were also alive almost 60 years ago, on November 22nd, 1963, the moment in time when we heard of President Kennedy's assassination, 
has also left an equally indelible imprint on our memory. In addition to creating those indelible memories, those two national tragedies have something else in common. Significant information our government uncovered during investigations of these crimes have been kept hidden from the American public. Even though a law was passed in 1992 to require the release of all documents related to JFK's assassination by the year 2017, over five years have passed since that deadline and key portions of the historical record remain hidden from public view. Why? What is so sensitive that both Republican and Democrat presidents, together with a host of unelected bureaucrats serving in intelligence agencies and federal law enforcement, feel that the American people can't handle the truth? A similar cover-up is occurring with what the U.S. government knew and when it was known regarding the 9-11 attacks. I realize that 22 years is a lot less than 60 years, but almost 3,000 Americans lost their lives that day, and their families, together with the rest of the public, deserve to know what the government knows. It's been over two years since President Biden issued an executive order to declassify documents connected to the 9-11 attacks. More than one year past the March 22 deadline for those agencies to complete their declassification reviews, the government has declassified and released only a little more than 4,000 pages of documents, many if not most of which are heavily redacted. Here, here's just a small little sampling. The problem with those redactions is it pretty well renders the documents incomprehensible. You know, the real information is kept from the American public. During the subcommittee's July 11th hearing, I entered into the record an 11-page document handed to me by representatives' families that lost loved ones on 9-11. That document, entitled Operation Encore, is only a small subset of the records the U.S. government has released pursuant to President Biden's executive order. And as you can see, it's also heavily redacted. It's a little bit harder to... Fan that one. A week following that hearing, on July 18th, Chairman Blumenthal and I wrote to the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation demanding unredacted copies of all the records that have been released pursuant to the executive order, including that 11-page document. Because both agencies failed to respond, Chairman Blumenthal and I reiterated our request for this information this past Sunday. On Monday, the FBI finally responded in what they claimed was a good faith effort to assist the subcommittee in its inquiry. Here's what we received. We got five extra pages, also heavily redacted, and we got a key to the redactions, which is publicly available anyway. Uh, I don't consider that a good faith effort, and quite honestly, in their letter to us, they have this statement, accordingly, we respectfully request the subcommittee not disseminate or otherwise disclose these documents or their contents, contents without prior consultation with the FBI. I just view that as a sad joke. If the DOJ and FBI continue to withhold these relevant documents, I hope this subcommittee will use every authority we have to compel compliance to our legitimate congressional oversight. Why should unelected bureaucrats be able to access and view these records without redactions while duly elected members of Congress who have full authority to view classified documents, why are we kept in the dark? Freedom can only thrive in an open society with a government that is honest and transparent with its citizens. My time in Congress has taught me that our federal government is far from living up to that requirement. So again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, our cooperation on this. Uh, you know, this inquiry started with certainly a, an event that interested me. You know, the, the PGA is coming to tr trying to come to agreement with uh, the PIF. Uh, I think the inquiry is expanding well beyond that. And I guess I would just say that the first step in our inquiry needs to be to continue to cooperate and use the full authority of this committee to get the gov government to finally come clean and be transparent with what they know about what happened on 9-11. And I think that alone will be very valuable. And where this goes beyond that, uh, I think you might have uh, even higher goals. It'll be interesting to 
see where this progresses. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Senator Johnson. I will commit to you that we will use the full authority of our committee to get as much information to be made public as we can. We're not letting this issue go. Yeah, let me also say, you know, we, there have been plenty of things in my investigations where information remains classified. And some things do need to be, remain classified, but we ought to have access to it. You know, we go down on the skiff and we read it. That can inform us. There's no, there is no reason whatsoever that this should remain outside of our review. You know, we've got that same authority. I would say we have higher authority than many of the bureaucrats that have access to information. So at a minimum, even if they don't make it available for public uh, display, we ought to be able to go and review it in the SCIF. We are going to arrange a classified briefing. We're talking to the FBI about dates. And if necessary, we'll use other tools. But let me also commit that not just you and I as members of this committee, but also the public right. should learn more. Uh, I have frequently said how overclassification, excessive secrecy, is damaging to the public interest. Our adversaries often know more than the American people. I completely agree, and I'll look forward to working with you on thank that. You. Thanks. Uh, let me introduce the witnesses, and thank you for your patience. Uh, Benjamin Freeman is a director of the Democratic Democratic, democratizing foreign policy program at the Quincy Institute, where he investigates money in politics, defense spending, and foreign influence in America. Mr. Freeman is the author of the Foreign Policy Auction, a book that seeks to systematically analyze the foreign influence of foreign influence industry in the United States. He's earned a PhD in political science at Texas A&M University. Brian Murphy is Managing Director at Logically AI, where he works with U.S. government agencies, companies, and others to help combat misinformation and disinformation. He previously served as both principal and acting undersecretary for the Office of Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. In these roles, he was responsible for the conduct of key intelligence activities supporting DHS and the intelligence community. Mr. Murphy was a special agent with the <coughs> FBI for nearly 20 years. During that time, he led the FBI's national level counterterrorism counter programs, including developing and implementing the FBI's program for counterterrorism. Mr. Murphy holds a PhD from Georgetown University and a Master of Arts in Islamic Studies from Columbia University. Joey Shea is a researcher in the Middle East and North African Division at Human Rights Watch, where she investigates human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. In this role, she oversees Human Rights Watch's work on Saudi Arabia, documenting the government's repression of civil society and a range of other violations. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, Ms. Shea was a non-resident scholar in the Middle East Institute and a non-resident research fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle Eastern Policy. We welcome all of you, uh, and now, as is our rule, I'm going to swear you in, if you would please rise. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you guys. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Freeman, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, and thank you, Senator Johnson, for having me here today to testify and for your commitment to this critically important issue. I'm also pleased to join my esteemed fellow witnesses on this panel, and we're eager to answer your questions about the PGA Live Deal in the Saudi Public Investment Fund. I'm the director of the Democratizing Foreign Program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Our focus is minimizing the influence of special interests on U.S. foreign policy. But critically to this hearing, I've been analyzing Saudi Arabia's influence in the U.S. for more than 15 years. So based on that experience, let me start by saying we'd be naive to believe 
that the PIF's actions related to the PGA Tour are not part of the kingdom's much larger lobbying, public relations, and broader influence operations in the US. Saudi lobbyists have made the case for this deal to members of Congress. Their public relations firms have made the case for the PIF to mainstream media outlets. This is part of the Saudi lobby's influence operations in the US. And I also think we'd be naive to believe that this is just another business deal. Last month at this subcommittee's hearing, the PGA Tour witnesses made that abundantly clear. There's no business case for this deal. As those witnesses said, and I'll quote, the live is an irrational threat, one not concerned with the return on investment or the true growth of the game of golf. So then if the Saudi government is not buying into a profitable investment, what are they buying? In short, they're buying our silence. They want to muzzle Americans critical of the regime. And they want to rebrand themselves. They want Americans to associate Saudi Arabia with golf and not with 9-11. All of this is especially important now as the US is considering offering the Saudi government security guarantees as part of a normalization agreement with Israel. This is a major foreign policy decision that can mean committing US troops to fight and possibly die for the Saudi dictatorship. The stakes could not be higher. So I thank this committee for investigating this now. At its core then, this is not a business deal. This is an influence operation. It's meant to shape US public opinion and US foreign policy. We do America a disservice if we do not evaluate it accordingly, especially given that censorship and the silencing of dissidents is part of the Saudi business playbook. U.S. businesses operating in Saudi Arabia, for example, they face rampant censorship. Our own U.S. International Trade Commission conducted a survey of U.S. businesses working abroad. And they found the number one censor was China, but right behind China, American businesses reported the most censorship in Saudi Arabia. Saudi government is also a major financier of Twitter, now X, and a Twitter employee has been convicted of spying on Saudi dissidents through the platform. Saudi government has also made major investments in Hollywood. This too has resulted in direct censorship by the Saudi regime. Specifically, when Oscar-winning documentarian Brian Fogel was working on a documentary about the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, it was virtually blacklisted in Hollywood. Even when the film did make it out, Saudi trolls launched a coordinated effort to tank its online review scores. And of course, we already know about the agreement that we're discussing here today between PIF and the PGA Tour containing that non-disparagement clause, which is explicitly designed to silence criticism of the Saudi regime. When asked to explain this non-disparagement clause, PIF representatives once again refused to appear before this committee, and as Senator Blumenthal mentioned, refused to provide the documents that were requested of them. Unfortunately, uh, I have to report that this is not at all unusual for Saudi influence efforts in the US. Not playing by the rules is part of the Saudi lobby's playbook. Two years ago, the Washington Post reported that the Saudi embassy operates a ring of what they called fixers that helps Saudis charged with crimes in the US literally flee justice and literally flee this country. The alleged offenses of the Saudis, the embassy helped flee, include possession of child pornography, rape, and even murder. Of course, as we've discussed, just two days ago was the anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Yet the victims' families, some of them I believe are here with us today, have still been denied justice from the Saudi government after two decades of fighting for it. A major reason for that is because the Saudi monarchy has spared no expense to avoid accountability. They've spent millions of dollars on this. They've even stooped so low as to trick US military veterans into lobbying against the 9-11 victims' families. So if this goes through, this is not just about golf. This is a crown jewel in the Saudis' reputation laundering efforts, and it will be used as part of their larger influence operations in the US. And this is not happening in a vacuum. China is watching. So what we do today will be seen by authoritarian regimes abroad. If we once again do nothing, this could become a blueprint for how to garner influence in the US open the floodgates for even more foreign domination of US sports, and it can be used as a tool for broader influence over our government, our media, and the American public. So I thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I very much look forward to discussing this further.
Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Murphy? Thank you for the opportunity to speak with the committee today. As my colleague said, it's uh, a privilege to be here with the both of them in front of this committee speaking about this important topic. Uh, this hearing is about the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, as we know. Uh, I'll offer two interrelated points up front. First, foreign-owned public investment funds are a positive commercial mechanism. That is so long as they are done transparently. The topic of foreign-backed covert influence campaigns impacting the homeland is not a new problem. The Constitution granted each citizen the right to the freedom of speech. This same privilege was intentionally not extended to other nations. That includes friends and foes alike. Because such a privilege in the hands of a foreign country was considered a national security threat. This is a threat that we now often call disinformation. It's a cheap and efficient way for foreign nations to utilize technology to support a full spectrum of influence operations that they conduct in the United States. Conversely, it is healthy to have foreign nations transparently present their points of view to the American people. When the source of the information is identifiable, an individual has the opportunity to judge the messenger and the message more clearly. Disinformation can be an ambiguous term. I use three criteria to determine if content can be considered disinformation. First, the identity of the content originator is intentionally masked. Second, the released information is content intended to influence an outcome. And third, the originator has a predetermined political, military, economic, or social objective. What makes disinformation a national security threat is its covert nature. People do not have the chance to judge for themselves the true origins and hence the motives of the information sender. As we consider disinformation, it is important to recognize it's just one aspect of a much broader foreign influence campaign that nations bring against the United States. Nations very much understand the additional protections offered to their operations if they can work through uh, they can work through and with American businesses and U.S. people. Behind all of these campaigns, of course, is money. The Saudi Investment Fund is reported to be approximately $780 billion. While I'm not here to address the full scope of the Saudi, the, the Saudi Fund's intention, I can say that a sizable fund such as that offers an opportunity for a foreign government to purchase influence and utilize proxies within America to conduct influence operations. What a government can purchase to exert influence can come in the forms of financing existing U.S. businesses, purchasing companies outright, contracting with firms that specialize in consulting, and creating U.S. jobs. After such transactions are completed, what and who is behind a narrative is often no longer clear. There are, of course, a number of laws and regulations um, already on the books to provide daylight to foreign influence in the U.S. We have the Foreign Registration Act, the Committee on Foreign in Investment in the United States, and the Foreign Investment Risk Review and Modernization Act just to name a few. However, something like a foreign investment fund does present a potential loophole. Something like the Saudi Investment Fund provides the opportunity for a foreign government to hide further who is behind its influence campaign. There is much on the record regarding Saudi's influence campaign in the US, such as the indictment my colleague spoke about of two Twitter employees and a Saudi national in 2019 who were working at Twitter, and the well-documented Saudi efforts to cover up the uh, murder of Jamal Khashoggi and try to influence the U.S. people about how that murder went down. However, because there is much more publicly available information on similar activities by other countries, such as China, examining some of these use cases also is important. I am not suggesting the nature of the relationship of China and Saudi Arabia with the U.S. are the same, but we do know that Saudi Arabia does copy some of the same tactics used by China. The Chinese scheme to covertly influence Americans is to use a full spectrum of Chinese government, political, economic and military levers to shape information so that other governments and local populations conform to their strategic objectives. Just over the, the last week, the Rand Corporation and Microsoft issued reports indicating the Chinese authorities' intentions to use artificial intelligence to covertly influence American people and policymakers. The U.S. government is generally more attuned to how Chinese investments in the U.S. could undermine national security. For example, influence campaigns in the U.S. associated with sister city relationships, academic partnerships, economic activity, and China, Chinese law enforcement offices in the U.S. have all been identified as part of their broader panoply of influence operations. Some parallels to how the Chinese and the Saudi use their financial positions to try to influence and shape the U.S. perception can be seen in sports, as been discussed today. Both countries have exerted a level of influence through the U.S. industry to conduct sports watching. Sports watching is a form of disinformation to promote or demote stories about a country through their U.S. athletes and their U.S. organizations they now control. To bolster their activities in one area of influence operation, both countries also utilize social media to create accounts that appear to be Americans, but very much are operated by these repressive governments 
and designed to sow disinformation. In conclusion, foreign-owned public investment funds are a positive commercial mechanism. But as I said in the beginning, they need to be transparently identifying how that money moves through the U.S. so that people can get the full transparency they need to make informed decisions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Murphy. Uh, Ms. Shea. Good morning, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson. Thank you for convening this hearing on Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. My name is Joey Shea, and I cover Saudi Arabia for Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is an independent, non-governmental organization that monitors human rights issues in over 100 countries. And we have been documenting human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia since 1997. I will focus my remarks today on the human rights abuses linked with Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, but first a note on those abuses associated with the PIF's chairman, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Um, since coming to power, uh, the Crown Prince has overseen the worst period for human rights in the country's modern history. He has overseen a historic and unprecedented crackdown on freedom of expression. The CIA found that he ordered the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and he also served as the commander of the international coalition that carried out scores of indiscriminate and disproportionate airstrikes on civilians and civilian objects in Yemen some with US weapons. Now, Human Rights Watch has extensively documented the Crown Prince's consolidation of political and security power since 2017, and the dire implications for human rights. In tandem, the Crown Prince has also consolidated economic power, most notably via the PIF. Now, the Crown Prince, the Saudi government, and the Public Investment Fund are inextricably interlinked. This raises serious concerns for US businesses that are engaging with the public investment fund and the possible links that this may create with abuses in Saudi Arabia, particularly as the fund expands its investments in the United States in key sectors of the American economy. Um, MBS wields significant control over the PIF and exercises unilateral decision making without transparency nor accountability. The restructuring and dramatic expansion of the PIF in recent years has consolidated to a historic degree vast economic power under the Crown Prince alone. Now the PIF's five-year program strategy ostensibly um, lays out a robust governance and operations framework However, recent media reports suggest that the Crown Prince can easily circumvent these institutional safeguards. The PIF has been ranked as amongst the least transparent, least accountable, and with the least credible governance structures in the world. The Public Investment Fund under Mohammed bin Salman has facilitated human rights abuses and has benefited from human rights abuses including the 2017 corruption crackdown that involved the arbitrary detention, um, uh, ill treatment, and extortion of property from current and former government officials, rivals within the royal family, and prominent businessmen. The corruption crackdown involved detaining dozens of people and pressuring them into handing over assets in exchange for their release outside of any recognizable legal process. Court documents obtained by Human Rights Watch show that in 2017, one of MBS's advisors ordered Yasser El Rumayan to transfer 20 companies that were seized during the crackdown into the public investment fund. There's a serious risk that these companies were transferred without due process. The court documents also indicate that one of the companies that was transferred was Sky Prime Aviation, which is the charter jet company that owns the two planes that transferred Saudi agents to Istanbul, where they murdered J Jamal Khashoggi. Over the past several years, the Saudi government has embarked on an aggressive campaign to deflect from the country's image as a pervasive human rights violator by hosting high-profile celebrities and sporting and entertainment events. The agreement between the PGA Tour and the, P the PIF effectively enables the Saudi government's sports washing, in part because it places the Saudi government in an unprecedented position of ownership, control, and influence over an entire sports league. 
Now, despite Saudi efforts to deflect from its image as a pervasive human rights violator, human rights violations continue. Just last month, Human Rights Watch documented the mass killing of Ethiopian migrants and asylum seekers by Saudi border guards, which, if committed as part of a deliberate strategy by the Saudi government to murder migrants, would constitute a crime against humanity. Now, based off of our research into the links um, between the PIF and human rights abuses, we are urging the adoption of legislation to increase scrutiny of foreign acquisitions of US businesses, particularly to identify the human rights risks and corruption risks prior to the acquisition. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'll, I'll begin the questioning. We'll have five minute rounds and uh, we'll have a second round uh, I want to uh, begin, Mr. Freeman, by digging down a little bit into what you've called faux grassroots campaigns. You've written extensively about Saudi influence efforts across the United States. And can you tell us what you mean by that concept of faux grassroots campaigns and what the Saudi objectives are in using them? Yes, Senator. This is a tactic that we've seen the, the Saudi influence operation use post Khashoggi. Uh, as I refer to it, when they started losing the battle on K Street, they took the battle to Main Street America. And they hired a number of public relations firms in, in the heartland of this country. And what those organizations do is, is try to organize uh, PR type events for Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and, and they work with everything from local chambers of commerce, uh, small businesses, uh, even small Etsy shops, and even uh, high school uh, newspaper journalists, we've seen them contacting even. They're, 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 they're seemingly no one they won't reach out to. Uh, to, to spin press in local jurisdictions, uh, create uh, positive events uh, for, uh, for the Saudi regime, uh, including having the Saudi ambassador and other embassy spokesperson uh, go out and talk to folks in middle America. Uh, what they do then uh, with, with these, uh, uh, the, these events that they, they help to orchestrate, those events sort of get laundered back to us in DC where uh, other firms who work for, for the Saudis, they then take the news clippings from those events, the positive press, the stories, the, the radio interviews that they help to orchestrate uh, themselves. And then they send those back to, to folks on the Hill, to, to you and some of your colleagues even. And they try to make it appear as if these events are all happening organically, that there's just this upsurge in support for Saudi Arabia from your constituencies, your states, your local jurisdictions. Uh, when in fact, all of this is just being created by the folks who are on the Saudis uh, payroll. And that's why I refer to it as a, as a faux grassroots operation. And this question may seem to have an obvious answer, but maybe you could just put it on the record. How does, the Saudi takeover of the sport of golf. It's using Live Golf to take over the PGA Tour fit into that strategy. Uh, it, 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 I would say it, it, it increase, increases the availability of opportunities for, for that faux grassroots operation. You know, every time then there's a local PGA event, immense opportunities for, for, for sports washing, for creating the, the, those local stories that they've become so good at. Um, and it raises the, the, the profile of a PGA event. I, I, I hail from the great state of Florida where, where the PGA is based. And um, uh, uh, golf is, is up there with football in terms of its importance. So whenever there's a PGA event, it gets news coverage. And so if the Saudis are able to influence that and spin that narrative back here to us in DC, it can be a very powerful weapon in their influence operation. So the Saudi logo, the Saudi merchandise, the Saudi promotions, all fit that grassroots faux grassroots strategy. Mr. Murphy, uh, you spent your career helping to protect our nation against national security threats. Why does the Saudi tactics and strategy here trouble you? I think it, it troubles me for a couple of reasons. One, the what's been said here today by my colleagues and myself is what they're trying to accomplish, which is to whitewash the, the parts of the Saudi um, 
efforts that are against the norms under which we live. Uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi is unfortunately an easy one to uh, point out. And so they're trying to create that image so that as policymakers go about their work, there's an obfuscation about what Saudi Arabia is really about. It's a complicated relationship that the United States has with Saudi Arabia, and that's not unique. But at the same time, um, this, this kind of laundering of information tries to change that relationship. Uh, Ms. Che, uh, uh, I mentioned, and I think you did as well, the links between the PIF, the Crown Prince, and the human rights abuses that so trouble us here. Uh, there are filings in a Canadian court action. I know you are aware of them. They've been reported first by CNN and uh, later acquired and reviewed by responsible statecraft and insider and other outlets that reveal that Sky Prime Aviation was transferred to PIF on December 22nd, 2017. Two Gulfstream jets owned by Sky Prime Aviation shuttled Khachoggi's assassins in and out of Istanbul less than one year after that transfer of ownership occurred. More than circumstantial evidence here. This kind of complicity couldn't have happened without knowledge at the highest levels of the Saudi government. Would you agree? Um, the PIF is chaired by Mohammed bin Salman. The um, council that oversees the board of directors of the PIF is also chaired by Mohammed bin Salman. He is the prime minister of the country. Um, and as I stated before, he exercises unilateral decision-making power over um, the PIF's decisions and investments. Um, and it would be deeply surprising if he did not know about this. Based on your experience, Mr. Murphy, would you agree? I think the CIA assessment has led us to that, and I have confidence in that assessment, and I do agree. Mr. Freeman? I agree as well. I will turn to the ranking member for his questions and then come back after he finishes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For, first of all, let me state, I, I find the Saudi Arabian human rights abuses ab abhorrent, as I think we all do. Uh, if I was to evaluate on how many billions they spent doing their sports washing, it doesn't seem like they're getting very good value for their, their dollar. I mean, this hearing is evidence of it. I mean, would you disagree with that? I mean, I understand, you know, the full events. I understand how they could try and do this, but it doesn't seem to be working too well. Would you agree with that, Mr. Freeman? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the question, Senator. I, I, I think I would agree with that if, if we look at this as a short-term investment for them. Certainly, the, the, the PIF's investments, uh, you, you know, of the last f few years in, in golf are, are just absurd. You know, you, you pay Mickelson, uh, Phil Mickelson, more than he's right. made in his entire career. Well, by the way, when was the PIF established? I mean, how long have they had a sovereign wealth fund? Do you know? Oh, I defer to my colleagues on that. Uh, 1971, um, and from 1971 until 2015, the PIF was housed under the Ministry of Finance, and in 2015, um, there was a decree that was issued that transferred the PIF from the Ministry of Finance. Yeah, it's it's taken CEO. them since 1970 to build up this wealth fund, seven, eight hundred billion dollars. Is that correct? I mean, the uh, the, P the PIF has grown um, tremendously since that's, 2015. That's about the value right now, about seven, eight hundred billion dollars. You know, as, as I stated in my opening uh, comments, our government's not being honest. They're, they're not being transparent. If, if you really take a look at who's doing the majority of the covering up for the Saudis right now, I would say it's the U.S. government. Would you disagree with that, Mr. Murphy? I think uh, I don't know the reasons why, and they're, they're incomprehensible. That was going to be my, my next question. I mean, first of all, do you agree? It seems like our federal government is probably doing more covering up for the Saudis than the Saudis are doing for themselves. I don't have the full facts, but I would agree with you. It does, on the face of it, it seems incomprehensible that they would not release 20 plus years later information related to 9-11. Uh, having been on the other side of these uh, discussions, there is a time factor that is, that is often very uh, instrumental. So I think I do agree so with you. The, the, the question is why? 
Why, why would our government cover up for the Saudis? I, I don't know. I think the answer is somewhat obvious. We buy a lot of their oil. Uh, quick back of the envelope calculation for my staff, about $16 billion a year. I mean, I don't know how much of that $700, $800 billion of PIF, and PIF uh, investment is you know, U.S. consumer dollars, but we've invested that money. So I, th I think the, the point I'm trying to make here is just being realistic. What would we rather have them do with our money? Um, the Biden administration, because of the Khashoggi murder, uh, entered office pretty hostile. And the reaction of Saudi Arabia then was to run to the Chinese and start selling them oil using Chinese currency. I mean, the greatest threat we face being $33 trillion in debt is to have the U.S. dollar no longer the world's reserve currency, and this is how you move down that path of losing that status. Um, so wouldn't that be part of the rationale that the U.S. is, in terms of our foreign policy, is somewhat sensitive, uh, try, trying to maintain some kind of relationship as well as a, a counterbalance to, to Iran in the region? I mean, there's some real politics playing in here, correct? Mr. Freeman, it looks like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, yes, Senator. Uh, I, 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 I think I agree with a lot of that assessment. I, I, I think when we're talking about Saudi investment in America, you know, not all of their investments are created equally. And I think both, both you and Senator Blumenthal in your opening remarks made that clear. What, the troubling part of the PIF's investments related to this deal are an utter lack of transparency. And our, the, our pardon? An, an utter lack of transparency. And we don't have insight into where these investments are going. Part, part of the problem is what, what could they really do about it? I mean, in, in our previous hearing, we had testimony, we saw emails that if the PGA doesn't do a deal with PIF, PIF's just going to double down. And they'll, again, eventually they will, they will provide contracts to the best golfs in the world and destroy the PGA. And again, golf is not just a U.S. sport. It's a global sport. And so that, it was, again, that was the point I was trying to make in the last hearing is the PGA is looking at an existential threat, it's not a fair fight. They're a $1.5 billion entity versus a $700 billion entity. So again, I'm just trying to look at the reality situation. What can we do about this? I mean, do we pass a law, we stop buying Saudi oil? Do we pass a law and say, we're not gonna let Saudi Arabia take our money and invest in the US, we're gonna make them invest that in China. Again, what, what is a practical solution to this problem? Again with the underlying basis that we all find their human rights abuses abhorrent. Senator, I think that I don't have the perfect solution, but what I would offer is that, uh, as my colleague said, these are long time campaigns and the investment or the takeover of PGA is just one of a lo much larger organizational whole of government from Saudi Arabia exercise to conduct influence operations. So I think we can't just look at it Again, as... So my, my, but my question is, what do we do about it where we're not cutting off our nose to spite our face? Where what our solution is, isn't the, the cure is worse than the disease? I think transparency is a good start, and then this hearing is a, a great forum to exercise that in. And that's where, again, we'll go back to transparency starts with within our own government to become transparent, to you know, cough up what they know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, the record will reflect that the, at least two of the witnesses are nodding in approval about greater transparency from our own government. Uh, but I do think that Senator Johnson raises a very important point. What do we do about it? And that is the goal of these hearings. Uh, and my initial reaction to what we've heard so far is that there are gaps and loopholes in the reporting of foreign government investments in this country. And we're not talking about foreign investors, private individuals. We're talking about the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Public Investment Fund, the Russian or Chinese disguised and concealed funds that may be shell corporations run by oligarchs. Some of them have been seized. There's litigation about it, but transparency, greater disclosure is certainly one avenue we ought to pursue. And uh, I'm gonna come back to this issue, but I really wanna follow up on a point that uh, Ms. Shea commented on. 
the, the growth in the PIF, the PIF, uh, my understanding is that the growth has been most concentrated in the last few years, correct? Yes, yes. When it was in effect under the control of the Crown Prince, correct? Yes, absolutely. So as I mentioned, um, between 1971 and 2015, the PIF was housed under the Ministry of Finance. Um, and after 2015, it was uh, when King Salman came to power, he created the Council on Economic and Development Affairs, um, which MBS headed since its creation, and the PIF was then moved um, to be under CETA, this committee. And starting in 2015, we saw a, a dramatic expansion of the PIF. And you commented, I think, uh, I may not be quoting you exactly, but uh, the PIF and the Saudi government are inextricably intertwined. The governor of the PIF, al Romanian, is a close confidant and friend, very good friend of the crown prince. Could you comment on other ways that they may be linked together, as you said, inextricably? Yeah, absolutely. So Yasser al Rumayan and MBS are very closely personally linked. Um, and as I mentioned, recent media reports have suggested that the institutional safeguards that the PIF, you know, writes about and, uh, and you know, sort of uh, relies upon are easily circumvented by the crown prince. Um, there was a documentary uh, that was produced by NBC, uh, a Saudi, Saudi government-backed broadcaster, where Rumayan himself details an incident at the beginning of 2020 uh, during the crash on the markets of COVID um, when MBS wanted to invest um, heavily in a, a range of um, different interests. And this uh, move was uh, opposed by the board of directors. And MBS went beyond the board, circumvented the safeguards, and went directly to the king. Uh, and Ruman details how the king issued a decree um, that allowed uh, these investments to go forward, even though they had been opposed by the board. Um, and you know, beyond this example, in a country such as Saudi Arabia, um, where there's so much you know power concentrated uh, under MBS himself political power, economic power, security power, these institutional safeguards um, are very weak. Um, the parallel has been drawn to China and Russia. Perhaps uh, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Murphy, Ms. Shea, you could expand a little bit on that point. I think that if we, if we consider how money is used by China in their Belt and Road Initiative, again, a part of a much broader campaign, there are some parallels with the Saudi Investment Fund here. Um, so what happens is over a, an extended period of time, as the investments uh, become much more entwined with that company's business and, and the company runs into crisis, there's leverage that China, for example, will play against other businesses and countries. That pattern by Saudi is, is likely to be repeated, as we have seen in other areas. So these funds are used as that full spectrum, part of their full spectrum uh, campaign to exert leverage. Mr. Freeman. Yes, Senator Blumenthal. I, I, I very much look at this as authoritarian regimes learning from other authoritarian regimes, e efforts to garner influence in the U.S. And you, we've seen this in sports, you know, with the, the, the NBA in China, I, I, I think was a good test case. The Saudis were watching that deal. And, you know, they saw the, the effect they could have on censorship of the NBA and its players there. Uh, but we've also seen this in U.S. higher education, too. This committee has done a commendable job of looking into foreign investments in higher education as well. And you sort of see an arms race there amongst authoritarian regimes, too, trying, trying to garner more and more influence in U.S. Uh, higher education. China at the forefront, but Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and other authoritarian regimes garnering influence there. And that's why I think it's critical when we look at this deal to realize that this could become a blueprint for China, for Russia, for another authoritarian regime trying to take over a U.S. sport. And the impact is not just in this country. The Chinese use the Belt and Road strategy in Africa and uh, 
countries elsewhere in the world, uh, and the takeover of Gulf has implications in terms of misinformation and disinformation, not only in the United States, but across the globe, does it not? Absolutely, without question. So the cognitive domain by which uh, the Chinese, or in this case the Saudis, try to dominate um, is critical for their foreign policy, their military um, diplomacy uh, efforts, or not diplomacy, but military strategy as well. So they're trying to either weaken a, uh, at what they would view as an adversary's nation's ability to respond um, or get them to change their, uh, their policies and positions on things. So it's highly intertwined. Uh, and, and I'll just finish with this question and then I'll turn to either Senator Marshall, if he's ready, or back to Senator Johnson. Uh, Senator Johnson quite aptly asked you about whether Saudi Arabia is getting its money's worth. Uh, given the proceedings before this committee, well, these proceedings are not in any way the result of a re request from Saudi Arabia. They've done everything, the PIF has done everything they can to, in effect, deny us information that we're seeking from them. Uh, and your distinction between the short-term effect and the long-term effect, I think, is also apt. As important as we think these hearings are and some of the publicity, uh, my hunch is that uh, the PIF and the Crown Prince are anticipating that memories will be short, especially among golf fans and the public in general, and that what remains is the washing whether you call it sports washing, white washing, of the atrocities that is the goal here. They're not looking to what the bottom line is quarter by quarter in return on investment. They're looking to the public's impression of the Saudi brand, correct? Senator, I, th I think that's absolutely right. If, if you look at this as a business investment, it's one of the worst business investments you could possibly think of. The, 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 the ROI here is just non-existent. I, I completely agree with you on that, Senator Johnson. I think, too, we, when you look at this, th this is a long-term influence investment. You know, it might take years. It might take decades. It's going to be very subtle. You, you know, if they wanted a short-term investment in influence, uh, you, you know, that's with the lobbying, the PR firms who can spin the immediate news cycle. Investments in this, like investments in higher education for authoritarian regimes, they're, they're long-term efforts to garner influence in the U.S. Thank you. Uh, Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for uh, to be here today. I continue to believe that the legal business dealings of private corporations should not be the subject of yet another hearing of this subcommittee and that we should be more focused on the pressing issues I hear about every time I go back home. Uh, it's skyrocketing inflation, it's the price of gas, it's groceries, a historic border crisis, the safety and security of their families. At the same time, I have nothing but praise for the PGA and the, and the Live Golf programs. I love to see opportunities for our young adults to do other things than play video games and be on social media. I think golf is one of those things that any young uh, American can get out and enjoy. Uh, it's become the, the, a communication opportunity for businesses. I love to see the competition out there. I know many fans prefer PGA and others prefer the live format, the, the, uh, the music and the upbeat nature of it, more of a team concept as well. And I know many of the players like this opportunity as well. When I go back home and I think about home again and why this hearing might be important to me, though, is um, of all the things my dad couldn't stand, it was a hypocrite. Someone for saying one thing and, and doing another or, or trying to pull the speck out of another person's eyes when there's a log in your own eye. So my first question is uh, from Ms. Shea. Human Rights Watch, the organization you're representing, believes that gender identity is an integral part of ourselves and should never lead to abuse. First question, at what age would Human Rights Watch believe that a child should be exposed by an adult to sexual content in schools? And secondly, does Human Rights Watch believe 
It is child abuse for an adult to encourage, perform, or administer hormone treatments, transition surgeries, or double mastectomies to minors. Thank you for your question. Um, I cover Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE exclusively for Human Rights Watch. So I am unfortunately not in a position to answer your questions, but I will um, speak to my colleagues in our uh, gender and LGBT division and get back to you with an answer. In general, has Human Rights Watch supported those types of endeavors to your knowledge? As I said, um, I cover Saudi and the UAE. I understand that, but you have no knowledge on such a critical issue of human rights that you don't know what your organ own organization represents. Um, as I said, I'm very happy to check with my colleagues. So you have no knowledge whatsoever of what the Human Rights Watch position is on this issue? As I said, I, I will check with my colleagues and I'll get back to you. But, but, right. So you do know, but you're not gonna tell us what their position is. I cover Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE. And You've been coached well. Human Rights Watch is opposed to the Florida law, so you do know this. They're opposed to the Florida law, the Parental Rights and Education Act, which prohibits instruction about sexual orientation and gender identity in kindergarten through third grade, and required that such instruction be age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. Recently in Florida, it was discovered that books across several counties were in violation of the law, including the book Gender Queer which depiction graphic sexual content. Does Human Rights Watch believe this kind of content is appropriate for young children to see in the school? As I said, I cover Saudi in the UAE, um, and my research concerns the human rights abuses that are associated with the Public Investment Fund. Um, I'm happy to go back to my colleagues and provide you an answer in writing. But you do acknowledge that the Human Rights Watch is opposed to this Florida law? Um, as I said, I cover Saudi and the UAE, and I'd be happy to go back to my colleagues. Um, we, I'm part of the Middle East North Africa division, and my research is focused exclusively on- I wasn't on here for the rest of the hearing. What exactly are your human rights concerns with Saudi Arabia? We have deep concerns yeah. um, over the Crown Prince's human rights records. Specifically, can you tell me specifically what those are? Absolutely. Uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has overseen a historic, unprecedented crackdown on freedom of expression. Just last month, uh, I mentioned previously that we documented the mass killings of migrants and asylum seekers with explosive weapons by Saudi border guards. Um, we found that if, this, if these killings were part of a deliberate strategy by the Saudi government to murder migrants, it would constitute a crime against humanity. A few weeks ago, I also documented a case, Mohammed El Ghamdi, who was handed down a death sentence based purely on his peaceful Twitter activity. So I, I just close with this. Again, I think it's the pot calling the kettle black. We have our own administration cracking down on freedom of expression, censoring many thoughts through all the, the, the COVID situation as well. Uh, it is, I just feel like we're a hypocrite when we're sitting here and we're not holding all countries on an equal standard. We pick and choose who we, we think is violating human rights. So again, we need to look at a mirror and take care of our own constitutional rights and protect them as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Senator Marshall. Uh, Senator Johnson. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, when we're talking about foreign policy issues and we're talking about, you know, conflict between nations, I don't know about you, but I always, I always feel a great deal of sympathy for the people that are being ruled by authoritarian regimes. Uh, in, our, in our first hearing, uh, PGA board member Jimmy Dunn made, I think, a pretty powerful statement. Um, and this came from the heart. I mean, J Jimmy is part of the 9-11 families, I and mean, he, he understands. He said, what, what he doesn't want is whatever we do here, uh, there are 18 million Saudis under the age of 32 that weren't around during 9-11, had obviously no involvement. He, he doesn't want them to think that America hates them. And it's a quandary. Uh, you, we're talking about a long-term influence peddling scheme. You know, I, I know the, the, the king, kingdom is trying to at least convey that they're trying to modernize the, the kingdom and they're you know, offering greater human rights. You'd like to think that's true, You'd like to think that Saudis are going to realize greater human rights. So, do you have? I mean, 
again, I, I find their human rights abuses abhorrent. I'm not being an apologist for it, but I'm wishing the best for the Saudi people. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Ms. Freeman? Uh, y y yes, Senator. I, I think it's very important whenever we have these conversations, we distinguish between the actions of the government of Saudi Arabia and, and the citizens of Saudi Arabia for exact, all the reasons you just mentioned. You know, most of the citizens there, as you mentioned, in all authoritarian regimes, they, they feel the pain of those authoritarian regimes worse than anyone does. And so we should not hold any actions the Saudi government does against those citizens. We have to keep our focus on, on that regime. So again, I, I think as we were talking about solutions, um, I think transparency probably is the best solution. Uh, I, I'm concerned anybody, when we start talking about misinformation, I mean, we just saw, saw the court uh, decisions in Missouri versus Biden where our government, I think unconstitutionally, and that's what the courts are ruling, uh, influenced, you know, tried to censor what they termed uh, disinformation, misinformation. I, I always go to Louis Brandeis, who probably about a century ago said that this, the solution for mis or disinformation is m not censorship, but more free speech, right? So uh, I, I come down on, on that, and that falls in line with transparency. So if we're going to really look for a solution on this thing, I think it, it really would lie in terms of transparency surrounding the investment of sovereign wealth funds in general. Because again, this isn't, just, this isn't just an issue with, you know, China's probably the worst abuser here. I mean, they're, they're the ones that have more, most inf infiltrated our society. They put the most pressure on U.S. citizens or U.S. corporations, whatever, trying to do business and, you know, trying to expand trade, that type of thing. So I, I, I'm intrigued by that. So do you have any comments on that or, or any ideas in terms of how you would enact better transparency? I think you'd target sovereign wealth funds, correct? Or would you target foreign investors in general? Um, you know, we think that it's important for there to be increased scrutiny over foreign investments in the United States, and particularly looking at the human rights and corruption implications of uh, foreign investment in the United States. You know, I, I'm quite confident that most American businesses do not want to become complicit in human rights abuses. So again, you say, and I think that you say greater scrutiny, specifically, what would you require? I mean, disclosure of what the investment is. I mean, what I'm trying to you know, drill down the detail. What do you want disclosed? I think part of it is if you look at parallels and that they are different. I'm in the private industry myself, so of course I don't want government you know, involved in every aspect of transactions. But where there are critical infrastructure, the 16 critical infrastructure sectors designated by the government to have some oversight because they are instrumental in our national security when it's a public investment or private investment into something that could impact that, you have to fill out lots of forms and there's lots of rules and regulations in there. This, this is a loophole, these public investment funds and others like them. So we have a repeatable process, uh, wouldn't look exactly the same. So if I wanna do business with uh, the US government, um, I would have to, as a foreign company, I have to fill out those forms. It, very similar here, I think there's a process there which doesn't give away all uh, the, the business records and secrets of uh, a business strategy. Almost like a, foreign, almost like a FARA. I mean, you just have to register you're making this investment. Because I will say, and I'll conclude on this, I am highly concerned if Congress all of a sudden inserts itself into a process of saying, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to identify a U.S. business that we're going to say is so iconic that no foreign government, or you know, we're, we're going to say who can and cannot invest. Again, if, you know, Saudis have, I don't know how many, how many different investments they have in the U.S. It's probably hundreds, right? I mean, you're saying $35 billion, I think is what uh, I heard the figure. Now, I just don't want Congress picking and choosing, going, no, this is the business that you know, we're going to rule out investment by X, Y, and Z company. We got to just have something that, Again, sort of lay the groundwork. If there's a need for transparency, make it somewhat uniform and hopefully not particularly onerous. Effective but not onerous. Does that make sense? It, it does to me, and I think that, uh, you know, most of that sentiment I would agree with, right? So the first step is that transparency um, and, you know, where the government's line is needs to be balanced with the 
um, the, the revenue aspects of private companies and what private companies bring to bear and, and the goodness that they, they will bring to the economy. Oh, I, I do appreciate your statement that, in general, foreign investment in the U.S. is a positive sign. If, if people aren't willing to invest in your country, you're doing something wrong with your economy. So it's not always, always good, but it's a good sign that foreigners want to invest because foreign investment creates jobs in America. I mean, I think we need to keep that uh, foremost in our brains as well. If, if I, I could add, that. Senator, I, I, I think your, your reference to the Foreign Agents Registration Act is very apt here. And FAIR is a statute that does not stifle any speech. It doesn't say, it doesn't pick winners and losers, like you mentioned. And so having something like that here, where you get the basic information, you get you get what's behind the deal. You get that con contract. And so, you know, we see where the money's going, you know, what exactly what's part of this arrangement. Unfortunately, the PIF hasn't provided any of that. Well, I, I did just get a note from my staff that USSA, we've just subpoenaed them. Uh, apparently they did file under FARA, so they've done that. I mean, well, I got it right here. <laughs> can I, can I, I'm just asking these questions. I mean, just uh, legitimate questions. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shea, I, I want to follow up on a point. Uh, Senator Johnson alluded to the human rights record in Saudi Arabia and the claims that the crown prince has inaugurated a new era of freedom. Um, my colleagues come back and say, my goodness, how wonderful things are. Women can drive. Uh, in your opening statement, I believe you said something quite to the contrary. And I wonder if you could expand on it. Absolutely. Um, as I said, under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia has dramatically deteriorated. Um, we mentioned, I mentioned this report about abuses from Saudi border guards against Ethiopian migrants crossing the border. We have been documenting abuses along this migration route since 2014. Um, there has always been egregious violations, arbitrary detention, but the violations that we documented in this report were mind-boggling, even to our own researchers. And the you know, dramatic deterioration um, along that route was significant and notable, not only just in their treatment of migrants and asylum seekers, but as well on freedom of expression. Last summer, we documented a case of a Leeds University student, Salma al-Shihab, who was sentenced to 34 years based off of her peaceful Twitter activity, and this at the time was you know, an unprecedented sentence. Just a few weeks ago, as I mentioned, we documented a sentence of a, a death penalty sentence being meted out for tweets as well. So there is a noted, you know, there's a documented deterioration in human rights abuses. For women's rights as well, even though women can drive, um, the women's rights activists who had lobbied for years for that right were detained, you know, arbitrarily arrested, tortured while they were imprisoned um, in the weeks before the driving ban was lifted. Uh, so we've seen, you know, women's rights in particular being used by Mohammed, Salman, Mohammed bin Salman as an example of his reform, um, but the reality could not be further from the truth. They passed the uh, law on personal status last year, and this law only codified discrimination against women. And your point about transparency, I think, is very important, that transparency ought to include coming clean about human rights abuses that may be occurring in the country that is reporting. And so Saudi Arabia ought to be coming clean about what its role was in the Khashoggi murder, what its role is in the killing of migrants attempting to come from Yemen, what its role is in the torture and imprisoning of journalists as well as dissidents. I think that point uh, deserves to be made. And also accountability as well. Accountability for apparent war crimes in Yemen. Accountability for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. We've seen time and again uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi authorities not being held to account for abuses that are clearly documented. And while at the same time, these abuses continue to get worse. 
and Mohammed bin Salman is 38 years old. He just turned 38. And we expect that he's likely going to be in power for many years to come. He's increasing his economic power immensely. Um, and as I said, has unilateral control over the PIF. And I think that this is deeply concerning. Um, uh, there, there's been a reference here um, to a number of acronyms, uh, FARA, CFIUS, uh, the requirements of CFIUS apply to public, to national security threats, in other words, the investment, an investment that may pose a threat to national security is required to be reviewed. Um, maybe just for the benefit of whoever is listening here and for the American public, why isn't that enough? I don't know if it's, uh, the, to me, I don't know if the, the question is not enough. It's just that the, the cognitive dimension of influence operations is generally not thought about as being one of the review criteria, to, criteria in the CFIUS process. It is, it is largely based on um, kind of how the, the country thought about threats before we saw AI, before we saw uh, these, these cognitive influence operations proceed. So, I think, I think the regulations and rules are there. It's just that we don't take this use case and use CFIUS as a model maybe to run it through. Having, having been in those rooms, it's very rarely will uh, something in the inter entertainment industry, sports industry be thought of in that way because it's looked at a very discrete purchase or transaction and not as a full spectrum, part of a full spectrum uh, foreign adversary campaign against the United States. So the idea is that when a foreign government, and not just the government, but as we've talked about PIF, it is an instrumentality of the government. It's operating as an agent of the government. Uh, the kingdom uh, and the crown prince benefit from its investments. And as Mr. Freeman has pointed out so well, the point of those investments are not what ordinarily drives entrepreneurs, namely return on investment. It is an instrumentality and agent of the state in seeking to elevate the state's image abroad, engage in disinformation and misinformation, and it therefore is a threat potentially to our national security through that misinformation campaign. So we ought to know whether foreign government or its instrumentality is investing not just in public companies that are registered with the SEC, but also private entities uh, and, and others. There was, uh, uh, I think Senator Johnson referred to China as, and I'm quoting, the worst abuser, but we frankly don't know who are the worst abusers because we don't have that information, correct? I, I think that's absolutely right, Senator. And I think to, to, to your point and, and, and to Dr. Murphy's point too, these, these long-term influence operations, our, our, our laws on the books are really not good for providing us with transparency of them, whether it's, whether it's CFIUS or you know, whether it's FARA or any of these other laws we have. They're more focused on the short-term issues of influence, you know, the, the sort of lobbying, public relations, direct national security threats, spying, espionage, that sort of thing. We are, as a nation, rather ill-equipped to, to, to get at these sort of soft, long-term influence operations. And so, to, to Senator Johnson's earlier point, that could be an issue, too, that we explore in terms of, you know, how do we fix these problems going forward? How, how do we counter these long-term in, influence operations? Um, FARA applies to lobbying, which is different, even though it does seek to influence our political process. It's not the kind of more massive disinformation or misinformation campaign, the faux grassroots campaign, for example, that you described. Is that correct, Mr. Murphy? I, I'm not, you know, a, a lawyer, but uh, yes, I think that's correct. That there's enough, just the way that we think about implementing these laws have not really caught up, as my colleague said, 
to where nation states take advantage of our open society and how they do that. And so as, as the information environments has shifted from the one to the many to the now to the many to the many, that is a, a delta that we need to take into account as we look at whether it's FAR or these other rules and regulations about how an adversary can operate across the full spectrum of capabilities and reach out and touch American people at any time pretending there to be Americans or, or someone else. So I just think the, the world's changed so much that some of these things are, don't, we don't think about them to apply them in the current situation. If I might just add to that, FARA, I, I'm, I'm one of the worst, uh, harshest critics of, of FARA. Uh, it is a law that was enacted in 1938. Most people didn't even have a TV. So it, it, FARA is just so ill-equipped to deal with the information and technological environment that we live in today. The loopholes are extraordinary. The, the, the lack of transparency is phenomenal. The, the need for FARA reform right now it is immense. And the longer we go without reforming that, the more vulnerable we are to foreign influence operations. Um. Ms. Shea, uh, I think I referred to NEOM, um, the planned city that is part of the Crown Prince's vision for 2030, I believe, um, and some of the human rights abuses in connection with it. Could you expand a little bit on that? Yes, so um, earlier this year, UN experts reported that three members of the Huaytat tribe in Saudi Arabia are at imminent risk of execution. Um, so the, these UN experts reported that they were really, uh, reportedly arrested for resisting forced evictions in the name of the NEOM project, which is the construction of a 170 kilometer linear city, city called The Line. Um, and these three individuals were reportedly sentenced to death uh, last August, and these death sentences um, were upheld in January of this year. Um, again, according to these UN experts, the authorities have reportedly carried out a series of actions to evict members of the Huaytat tribe from their homes and traditional lands in three villages uh, in the name of the Neom project. I want to uh, enter into the record uh, a document that is entitled Vice Pulled a Documentary Critical of Saudi Arabia, but here it is, Vice's hard-nosed coverage on Saudi Arabia changed after the investment deals with the repressive kingdom. A deleted documentary is not completely gone, however. Um, it is um, done by the uh, intercept, and uh, without objection, I'm going to make a part of the record. You have some knowledge of what happened? Uh, so Human Rights Watch hasn't independently verified the claims in this report, but we've, you know, of course, reviewed it, uh, and the claims are, are deeply troubling. And, you know, given the terrible human rights record of Saudi, which we've been discussing, and as well, of course, MBS himself, um, which are overseeing these abuses, and um, the country's, you know, noted record of censorship and suppression of freedom of expression, it's not at all surprising that the PIF um, and Saudi authorities would be attempting to, you know, purchase an American media company in an attempt to burnish its image um, internationally and to, you know, repress stories that are not, um, uh, you know, in the interest of the crown prince. Uh, in, in effect, uh the Intercept story states that six months after announcing this partnership deal with a Saudi government-owned media company, Vice Media uploaded and then quickly removed a documentary critical of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, that's exactly the kind of potential impact that should concern us. Uh, I described earlier some of the investments by the PIF in a number of entertainment and media companies. Uh, we don't know uh, precisely, we can hold up the poster, 
again, uh, we don't know much about this investment um, in vice media. It wouldn't trigger a review under CFIUS or any other national security process, would it, Mr. Murphy? Very, very unlikely uh, that it would. Um, as, as I've said and my colleague has said, it's just, uh, you know, it's not, we're not thinking about it in the way of how adversaries are using information to, as a, quite frankly, as a weapon. Um, and so I don't think it would trigger those. It potentially could, but I, I really find it doubtful that it, it would. So, and these are some of the sports uh, interests that the Saudi is have or are developing. There was a report just recently in the New York Times about its potential interest in the sport of tennis, which seems to be a kind of ripe takeover target because of its financial structure at present and the lack of central governance. Um, the uh, potential for its investment in other media companies is pretty frightening. Uh, but at, at present, there's no review that would apply here, either under CFIUS or FARA, is there? I don't think there is, no. Uh, no, and, and, and not under fair either. But I, I, I would completely agree with your point, Senator, that this is this is what these investments buy. It's it's the sounds of silence. We we hear nothing critical of from all of these entities that are up on that board, whether it's Vice News. It's not what we hear. It's what we're not hearing that should concern us. And just to add, yeah, just to add that the PIF is $700 billion approximately. And Saudi Arabia needs to diversify its economy away from oil. Um, this is one of the stated aims of the PIF. And certainly, you know, we believe that this is true. But when you have $700 billion in assets, you can afford to invest in a variety um, of different sectors to achieve a variety of different objectives and aims. So, you know, this is why we need greater scrutiny um, of these acquisitions and the evaluation of, you know, human rights concerns and corruption, because some of the investments may indeed um, make sound economic sense and not be used for the purposes of whitewashing or further, you know, repression, but many others may, you know, have these as their aims. Um, and that's why, you know, regulations are important so that we can, you know, protect American businesses from becoming complicit, potentially, in human rights abuses. Thank you. Senator Johnson? Yeah, just a quick summary. Um, I think the overall solution here is a free press that holds everybody accountable. Not, not one that's biased, that kind of protects one side or advocates for one side. And I earlier quoted Justice Brandeis, well, paraphrased Justice Brandeis, but again, he was deciding a case where there was misinformation that could cause public harm. And his full quote was, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies to, advert, to avert the evil by process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Again, it gets right back to the solution transparency. But again, a, a free press that by and large exhibits no bias, that is inquisitive, that digs into the truth. You know, so if, if you've got Saudi Arabia saying, oh, we've got this human rights program and we're opening up all these rights to women, but the truth is just the opposite, that's what we need a free press to inform us. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm big into transparency, I'm big into a free press, but, but one that is unbiased and, and again, the, the solution here is more speech, not uh, censorship, not enforced silence, because we just saw, I, I would say during, during COVID, the impact of people labeling misinformation the truth and the government censoring uh, people, and that, that didn't work out too well. And uh, right now we've got court decisions saying that was unconstitutional. So again, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm enjoying these hearings. I think these are raising some important issues. Uh, there may be a legislative solution here, but... Uh, the overall solution is more speech and a free press that's inquisitive and, and reports the truth. Free speech, 
all for free speech. Is there any in Saudi Arabia? Ms. No. Shea? None. How about free press? Not much of that either, unfortunately. Yeah, I hate to belabor the obvious, but we're dealing here with one of the most repressive autocracies on the planet. And they're trying to take advantage of free speech in the United States to suppress facts they don't like. That's why we've issued the subpoena today. More truth, more free speech. If you're an investigative reporter, can you get access to the facts that we've subpoenaed today, Mr. Freeman? Uh, no, Senator, not to my knowledge. That's why we're using compulsory process. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, as Justice Brandeis said. And we thank you for your expertise, your dedication to uncovering the truth, each of you and each of your organizations plays a vital role in the ecosystem of free speech and eliciting truth. So thank you for being here today. We will continue these hearings. We will pursue uncovering as much truth as we possibly can. And um, the issues here go beyond golf. They go beyond Saudi Arabia. and. Uh, I think they are of direct interest to the American people. Thank you so much. This hearing is uh, adjourned. The record will be kept over, open for 10 days for any additional comments or questions from my colleagues. Thank you very much.